Thanks for downloading the Intelligence Squared podcast. Here in London, we're already looking forward to the launch of our autumn season. One of the events we're really excited about is going to be on explaining how the technology that surrounds us actually works. And to do that, we're bringing together two of the world's masters of explaining and popularizing science. Randall Munro, the creator of the incredibly popular webcomic XKCD, and Marcus de Sautoy, Oxford's Professor for the Public Understanding of Science. That's happening on October the 2nd, and you can buy tickets for that at our website, intelligencesquared.com. Now, here's this week's episode. We hope you enjoy listening. Uh, welcome, ladies and gentlemen. So nice to see so many of you here today. And I think tonight is all going to be about the intersection of moral principle and historical fact, and the extent to which historical fact may or may not incline you to change your mind from the great historical principle that Anthony Grayling cites in the title of his own book on this subject, whether it is ever justifiable to bomb civilians. And some of the questions that you will probably be asking yourself tonight as uh, we get more and more into the history um, of this is, for example, if it were the case, that the bombing of civilians was crucial in stopping Hitler becoming victorious, would that change your mind? Would it change your mind if even that, if that were not the case, you were persuaded that the decision makers of the time were convinced it was the case? These are some of the things that I hope you will be thinking about and our speakers will be persuading you about as... um, as we, as we go on to this evening. All right, without more ado, let us begin this evening with our first speaker, Anthony Grayling, author of more than 20 books on philosophy and the founder and head of a new private university, the New College of Humanities. He's been quoted as saying that a third of your life is spent asleep, a third in Tesco's, and the other third is left to you to live as well as you can, which makes me think he's spent too much of his life food shopping and actually not enough doing philosophy. Anyway, over to you, Anthony. Thank you very much indeed. I'm sure I said uh, Wakefoot. I must begin with uh, uh, two preliminary remarks. The first is... But in my view, and I'm sure we all share this view, the Allied powers, principally Russia, the United States of America and uh, Britain, in their war against the Axis powers, were fully justified in conducting that war. And indeed, it's arguably the case that they had a moral duty to win that war because the Axis powers, and in particular Nazi Germany, were criminal regimes. They had to be defeated. Had they not been defeated, the history of the world would have been uh, a very much more terrible one. The second thing to say is that the airmen of the Royal Air Force Bomber Command and of the United States Army Air Force Bomb Groups were extraordinarily brave individuals. 55,000 members of RAF Bomber Command died in the skies over Germany, and that was a tremendous sacrifice. And nothing that I'm about to say should detract from the fact that they made that sacrifice. It raises a very difficult uh, problem for those of us who think that the bombing of civilian populations is not a morally acceptable way of uh, going on or conducting a war, uh, because it raises the great question about people who were doing their duty and who saw what they were doing as being part of a great cause, as indeed it was the cause of fighting Nazi Nazi Germany. Uh, But I think that's a separate debate, and I do think there is something to be said about it. But the remarks I'm going to make um, have the aim of persuading you that bombing civilian populations, the indiscriminate attacks by night on cities, was not a good thing to have done. That we, in looking back on the war and thinking about how we conducted the war, should ask ourselves this question. Given that it was a justified war, a right war, and given that it was something that we had to win, Does that justify everything we did in the course of it? It's the old and difficult problem. Does the end justify the means? And I want to argue that our 
view of the choices made by RAF Bomber Command and by the High Command of our military endeavour was in that one respect wrong. I don't say that all the activities of um, uh, Bomber Command were wrong. Of course, the great role that they played in the summer of 1944 was crucial in other respects. Their attacks on military and economic uh, and transport targets uh, in Europe were a very important contribution to the winning of the war. So it's one particular thing that I concentrate on, and that is what was known as area bombing, the bombing of cities. Now, most of the people who were engaged in planning and carrying out that strategy, most of them, not perhaps all of them, and perhaps not Bomber Harris himself as he's known, um, would at some point or other in the course of their education, uh, like yourselves, have spent a good deal of time uh, lying in the bath reading Thucydides. And so they would have uh, noted the reason that Thucydides gave for writing his account of the Peloponnesian War, namely that war coarsens moral fibre and blunts judgment about the right way to act even in times of dangerous conflict. And Thucydides pointed out that when Machelini, the city on the island of Lesbos, broke its treaty obligations to Athens and the Athenians discussed what they were going to do to punish this erstwhile ally, they first decided that they would go and massacre the citizens of Machelini. But the next day they changed their minds. They came to the view that to do that would be set a bad example to other allies and it would certainly not be a good thing in itself. Twelve years later, the island state of Milos broke its treaty obligations to Athens. And the Athenians didn't even discuss it. They just went and massacred them. And Thucydides said this is proof positive of the way that thinking changes in times of conflict. Now, in the First World War, Germany bombed these islands, sending over zeppelins and gothers. There were not that many casualties in comparison to bombing casualties in the Second World War, but there were just enough to terrorize everybody who thought that if bigger and better airplanes, and bigger bombers, and more bomb loads, more bomb tonnage were to fall on a country, of course it was thought that uh, 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 new wars would be very, very short. They would last only a few days because each of the combatant nations would bomb the other and it would be a matter of who could endure the longest. And so planning for bombing uh, was instituted early. And in the middle 1930s, very, very large uh, bombers uh, were designed and brought into production. And in the first uh, years of the 1940s, they came into service in the RAF, beautiful aircraft like the Lancaster bomber and the Halifax and others. For quite a while, in the first year of the war, the RAF uh, uh, bombers were not allowed to carry live weapons across the coastline of the continent in case a bomb fell out and hurt somebody. They carried live munitions in their raids against the uh, German fleets, but they didn't carry live weapons until the attack in the West, until Germany invaded uh, Belgium and France on the 10th of May, and after that, of course, the gloves started to come off. But it wasn't until 1941 that the order to RAF Bomber Command uh, was changed as to what their target would be. The great inaccuracy of bombing, the, the danger of trying to bomb by day, meant that the RAF had to change its tactics to the night bombing. The night bombing proved almost futile, it was so inaccurate. And so the, the order went out that the main target was going to be the morale of the enemy population. And this meant that there, there was going to be a bombing by night, indiscriminate bombing of civilian populations. And that's what happened. And it went on right the way through the war. Everybody thinks of Dresden. At the end of March 1945, Churchill himself sent a, a message to Sir Charles Porkel, who was the uh, commander of the Royal Air Force, and said to him, the terror bombing of Germany, he used this phrase, must stop because we are coming into possession of a ruined land. And Portal sent the message back and said, you can't send a message like this to me, you're accusing me of a war crime. And Churchill had to rephrase the message, but the original was kept on file, was published in 1960. And this was the result of Churchill's uh, horror uh, over what had happened at Dresden, or anxiety at any rate about what post-war sentiment would be. But right back in 1943, the terrible attacks on Hamburg, uh, the Operation Gomorrah attacks on Hamburg, showed something of what was involved in the nature of bombing. And just to tell you very briefly, because you no doubt know something about it, uh, the bombing on the second night of the raids on Hamburg caused a tremendous firestorm in which more people died than in Dresden, about 45,000 people, most of whom died of suffocation in their cellars because all the oxygen was taken out of the air in the city by the raging firestorm that was started, using mainly incendiary bombs after high explosives had blown off walls and 
and blown out windows and doors so that the fires could spread. And people who were caught in the fires were shrunk to the size of dolls by the tremendous heat. And a, a very early form of napalm was used, a kind of petroleum gel, which when it splashed onto people uh, and, and started burning, uh, made them jump into the canals in Hamburg and into the docks. But when they got out of the water, these uh, 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 people reignited. So it was a very, very terrible weapon, and it was designed to be so. In 1949, the uh, Fourth Geneva Convention was adopted, and in the drafting of it, an effort was made to include a clause that would outlaw the indiscriminate attacks on civilians. And the United States government and the British government refused to accept that clause because it would look like a, a retrospective uh, criticism of what they had done in the cities of uh, Germany, but also, of course, in Japan, and in some ways more terribly even in Japan. But in 1977, a protocol, two protocols were added, but the first of them was a protocol that did outlaw attacks, indiscriminate attacks on civilian populations. The government of the United Kingdom signed that protocol. The United States of America to this day is not a signatory to that protocol. But by accepting uh, the first the attempt to outlaw attacks on civilians, and then finally by uh, adding that protocol to the Fourth Geneva Convention, the international community has resolved on the basis of the experience of the two world wars that allowing artillery or bombing attacks to be directed without uh, any precise desire to destroy a transport link or a, an aircraft factory or ball belling factory or military installations, but just indiscriminately to attack and terrorize the civilian population would not be acceptable. And I think um, that uh, what is true now of uh, international sentiment on that applies throughout history. It applied certainly 2,500 years ago when Thucydides thought about something rather parallel, that kind of, of, of message. So my argument is that when we look back on our experience of conducting the Second World War, we should ask ourselves the question, did everything we do pass muster? When we look in hindsight, with all the benefit, of course, and safety of hindsight, and look back on it, are there any lessons we can learn? And surely the lesson is that that was not the right way to go. I'm sure my colleague would explain that there were alternatives, other things that we could have done that might very well have been more effective in the war. But the crucial point for us is the moral point. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, Anthony. Now, our next speaker started his career and became a very distinguished foreign and war correspondent and over the past decade has emerged as one of Britain's most exciting military historians. I'm sure many of you read Bomber Boys, Fighter Boys. He seems to crank out a book every other year and when he's not doing that, he's writing a novel on Afghanistan and the hell of it is he's only a couple of months older than I am. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Patrick Bishop. Good evening. Uh, I'm going to start with a couple of quotations. The first was delivered in a BBC radio commentary broadcast a few days after the RAF had just launched its first thousand bomber <coughs> raid on Cologne on the night of 30, uh, 30th to the 31st of May 1942. Uh, I quote, in 1940, when the Germans were bombing Britain, they did not expect retaliation on a very heavy scale, the speaker said. They were not afraid to boast in their propaganda about the slaughter of civilians which they were bringing about and the terror which their raids aroused. Now, when the tables had turned, they're beginning to cry out against the whole business of aerial bombing, which they declare to be both cruel and useless. The people of this country are not revengeful, but they remember what happened to themselves two years ago, and they remember how the Germans talked when they thought themselves safe from retaliation. Now, the speaker was George Orwell, a very English man, and a man, you might think, with a very highly developed conscious, con uh, conscience. And he said this in the very early days of the mass bombing of German cities. Uh, 469 people were killed in the Cologne raid, most of them civilians, uh, which was nothing compared to what was to come. But as, as the attacks grew heavier and civilian deaths multiplied, Orwell's line did not waver. My second quotation comes from a German. It too was made in a radio talk broadcast from America 
just after the town of Lübeck uh, had been attacked and large parts of it destroyed by the RAF uh, in the first firebombing of a German town. I think of Coventry, said the speaker, in reference to the Luftwaffe's bombing of Coventry in November 1940, and I have no objection to the lesson that everything must be paid for. Did Germany believe that she would never have to pay for the atrocities that her leap into barbarism seems to allow? The words are those of Thomas Mann, the great German novelist, a son of Lübeck, and himself the voice and conscience of the German civilization that Hitler and Nazism had overwhelmed and perverted. Like Orwell, man stuck to this view even when the war was over and German cities had been reduced to bones and ashes. So here we have two men of unassailable moral rectitude who lived through these terrible events who would challenge the proposition that we are debating here tonight. Now there are some crucial words in that sentence lived through these events. What we mustn't do, what we have no right to do is to look back at terrible episodes of history, such as the bombing of Germany undoubtedly was, and apply the values and the knowledge that we have today to decisions that were taken in desperate times. And those were desperate times for Britain. In the spring of 1942, when Arthur Harris had just taken over at Bomber Command, and the process of area bombing, as the bombing of cities was known, began, the war was very much going Germany's way. Britain had suffered defeat after defeat. In North Africa, our forces were on the defensive. German armies were deep inside Russia. And it seemed likely that before the summer was out, Hitler would be master of the whole of Europe. And in 1942, the only weapon we had in our hands, the only way we could reach out and take the war to Germany, was the air crews and machines of Bomber Command. Now, until now, as Professor Grayling has said, Bomber Command had had a disastrous war. A few of the extravagant claims made for it before the conflict started had turned out to be true. The proponents of strategic bombing, as it was called, had held out the prospect of bombers ranging deep into Germany, striking with great accuracy at the vital organs of its war industry, oil refineries, factories, and so on, and paralyzing its ability to fight. But Bomber Command was nowhere near capable of delivering pinpoint strikes on strategically important targets. Indeed, their efforts were almost ludicrously inaccurate. Now, to be sure, the air crews would far rather have been bombing oil refineries and steelworks and barracks than cities, although the same cannot be said for Arthur Harris, of course. Uh, but this was not possible on any meaningful scale at this stage of the war and would not be so for another two years. And this went for the Americans of the US Army Air Force when they began, when they began arriving uh, in Britain, as well as the RAF. No, in 1942, the smallest target the RAF could hit was a town or a city. So that, with the approval of virtually everyone in the political and military establishment, is what they did. This was a momentous decision to take, and it was known to be so. Britain had started the war, as Professor Grayling said, determined to avoid civilian casualties, and crews had been under the strictest instructions not to menace population centres. No one, neither the planners, nor the crews, nor the public at large, was under any illusion about what the decision would, make, would mean for the people living in those German cities. Yet it went ahead. Why? The answer is simply because the only alternative to bombing cities was a policy of passivity, passivity in the face of great evil, and that, for most, was not an option. Everyone in Britain was united in their determination to resist and defeat Germany, and most believed that it should be done by whatever means possible. That included the air crews. About 120,000 men passed through Bomber Command. Of those, very few doubted the justice of what they were doing during or after the war if they survived, and of course 55,000 of them didn't. There were some brave voices in both houses, houses of Parliament, as well as the church and the press, who spoke out against the perceived barbarity of bombing, but most Britons approved. The attitude can be summed up in the words of one man interviewed by mass observation on the streets of Coventry just after the 
1940 raid. We're fighting gangsters, he said, so we've got to be gangsters ourselves. We've been gentlemen too long. In other words, the Germans had started the war, they had conducted it with unparalleled brutality, therefore the normal rules did not apply. By abandoning restraint, by ignoring all the laws of war such as they were, the enemy had forfeited any right to restraint being shown towards them. Such are the moral compromises that war inevitably brings about. But this wasn't a simple matter of pointless revenge. Those engaged in bombing Germany believed that they were hastening its military and industrial collapse, that they were helping to bring the end of the war closer, a war that every day it continued meant the deaths of tens of thousands of innocents at German hands. Now, some of the assumptions behind the campaign would turn out to be profoundly wrong, notably the idea that German morale would crack and force the collapse of the regime. I would also disagree with the decision to carry on bombing cities into 1945 when it served little or no useful military purpose. But in many respects, the planners and directors were right. The campaign did hasten the end. It's easy to lose sight in the controversy over area bombing of the fact that Allied bombing did vast damage to German war industry and the German war effort. Anthony Beaver will explain just how much. The damage may not have been as extensive as hoped for or claimed, but how much stronger would Germany have been if the Allied air forces had not made those great efforts? In closing, I'd like to say two things. When considering how justified the bombing campaign was, I'd ask you to view the question not through 21st century eyes, but from the perspective of those living in the worst years of the war when Britain was fighting a monstrous enemy with extremely limited means. Then I think you'd share the judgment of Noble Franklin, a Lancaster navigator who survived numerous missions and went on to write the official history of the strategic air campaign. He wrote that in the early years of the Bomber War, when it seemed that the campaign might actually be abandoned, that the great immorality open to us was to lose the war against Hitler's Germany, to have abandoned the only means of direct attack which we had at our disposal would have been a long step in that direction. And finally, I'd ask you to think about the words of Thomas Mann, the good German whom I quoted at the beginning, which appears in his post-war novel, Dr. Faustus. The narrator looks around at the pulverized cities with anguish. But I cannot allow myself to forget, he says, that terrible though German defeat is, it is nothing compared to the thought of the horror of German victory. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Patrick. Now, our next speaker is not only one of the foremost historians of the Second World War, he has also been, and for all I know may still be, Times editor of the, and I want you to take this word very seriously, complete history of the world. <laughs> this guy knows a thing or two. He's also a man of whom the late Eric Hobsbawm called Erudite, which coming from Hobsbawm is a compliment indeed. Ladies and gentlemen, Richard Overy. Well, thank you very much for those kind words of introduction. And I want to start off by reminding us of the two uh, strategic aims that bombing was supposed to have uh, when it was undertaken in 1940. The first is that it would unhinge the enemy's war effort. The second thing is that it might produce a political dividend by profoundly demoralizing the enemy population, uh, compelling them to put pressure on the Hitler government and possibly producing surrender. Now, there are three things, I think, to observe first uh, about these ambitions. The first is that in 1940 or 39, when the RAF thought about doing this, there was no evidence that a sustained bombing campaign would do either of those things. Indeed, the only evidence there had been 
uh, was a rather half-hearted and small bombing uh, offensive at the end of the First World War, whose results were uh, completely inconclusive. The only experience that the RAF had had of bombing, of course, was so-called colonial policing, in which a handful of aircraft would fly over uh, some kind of tribal enclave, drop some bombs, uh, drive the uh, tribe to surrender, uh, and as a result, uh, allowing the RAF to claim uh, that bombing had uh, immediate and clear results. The serious bombing in the 1930s was in the Spanish Civil War, and what's striking, I think, is that the RAF was among the major air forces, the only one that looked at the Spanish Civil War and did not draw the obvious conclusion. The bombing didn't achieve a great deal, but the aircraft in support of ground forces, whether naval forces or the army, did achieve a great deal. And indeed, it explains why uh, the Soviet Air Force, the German Air Force and the French Air Force by 1940-41 were more or less air forces committed to uh, combined arms operations in support of surface, uh, the surface forces. The third thing is preparation. Um, now, I, I, many of you, I'm sure, know the story that by 1940, a Bomber Command, despite all the commitment of the 1920s and 1930s, was fundamentally unprepared uh, to launch an, uh, an operation uh, of any magnitude uh, against the German homeland, and indeed was unable to do so uh, until well into 1943. What's even more striking, I think, is the paradox that at precisely the time that Bomber Command was thinking about what it was going to be doing in the late 1930s, uh, a great deal of Britain's air effort was being devoted to building up our radar chain and fighter command and extensive civil defences, precisely to demonstrate that it was possible to combat bombing, that the bombing bomber would not always get through. And the RAF operated in 1940 with extraordinary schizophrenia, one half of it saying we could defend well against bombing, or effectively enough, the other saying that we could bomb and achieve something decisive. My argument is that by 1940, there really was no uh, strategic justification for what it was that Bomber Command was claiming. In that sense, the campaign, once it got going, was not really strategically justifiable. Now, what made this point even more obvious, of course, was the Blitz. The Blitz demonstrated, if you needed demonstration, first of all, that uh, long-term and intensive bombing did not break morale. Indeed, this was the biggest offensive it had ever been. There never had been an offensive in which 43,000 civilians were killed um, uh, away from the fighting front. Here it was, there were scares, of course, people worried about it, but in fact, as we all know, British morale did not break. Nor was the British economy affected much by the Blitz. Calculations made in the summer of 1941 by the Ministry of Home Security showed that Britain's uh, econ economic potential had been reduced by about 5% uh, and was quickly made up again uh, after May 1941. Uh, now, all of this was known to the RAF uh, and discussed, indeed, in the Air Ministry. So there had to be some additional justification for why you wanted to persist with a bombing campaign. One of them was the argument that the Germans uh, were nowhere near as tough as the British who bombed the Germans. Uh, they're bullies by nature, it was said. Uh, they will fold up where the British didn't fold up. The other was to look at some of the evidence from the Blitz and to distort it or misinterpret it. The, the most obvious or example I've come across uh, was the evidence of absenteeism. A great deal of anxiety about whether bombing would stop workers going to work, whether they'd stay away for months, whether production would collapse as a result. So the Ministry of Home Security undertook a number of uh, detailed studies of places that had been heavily bombed, and they found that workers in fact returned in most cases within two or three days. Um, in Liverpool, uh, even in uh, uh, Clydebank, which was heavily hit by bombers. Uh, in the end, three quarters or more of workers were back at work after two or three days. Uh, uh, Churchill was told that the evidence from Hull and Liverpool and so on and so on made it clear that if you bombed heavily enough, workers would stay away from work. It wasn't true, and it wasn't true in Germany. Well, we've heard 
uh, already this evening that bombing achieved a great deal. It did. It flattened a lot of cities and killed 350,000 people. Um, but in terms of economic effects, those were muted. Um, even by uh, 1944, when Germany was being subjected to the heaviest air assault that's ever been, um, it was possible to expand output considerably uh, up until September of that year. And German morale, of course, never cracked in the sense that people hoped it would. Uh, there was never a political overthrow or a political crisis. I want to end by saying that, interestingly enough, this is not just my view, it was also the view of the RAF. In 1947, um, Lord Tedder, who had been Eisenhower's deputy and was now chief of staff, um, conducted what was called Exercise Thunderbolt. It was a high-level exercise for three or four days where a whole lot of airmen and experts came together and they looked back and they thought about what bombing had done and was it worthwhile. I'm very struck by two speeches which were made by Norman Bottomley, who was the Deputy Chief of the Air Staff, the man responsible for sending the orders to Harris all the time during the last part of the war. And what Bottomley said was, we have to be honest about Bomber Command. Uh, it was completely unprepared and didn't know what it was doing in the first two or three years of the campaign. But the critical question, what did it do, uh, forced him to conclude in this audience, first of all, um, that morale in Germany was never critically affected by bombing. And secondly, that the industrial system of Germany, uh, located in its major cities, was also never critically undermined by bombing. And I think that's quite a stunning indictment of uh, a, a campaign which Bottomley was, of course, uh, partly responsible for conducting. Now, the implication of what I've said, and I'm concluding now, the implication of what I've said, of course, is those resources might well have been used for something else. What else could they have been used for? Well, this is a counterfactual, and I'm not going to spend time now uh, exploring all that counterfactual, all this counterfactual possibilities. But if it's something anybody wants to raise in the discussion afterwards, uh, I'd certainly be happy to respond to it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Richard. Now, our next speaker, the author of such major bestsellers as Stalingrad, Berlin, the downfall 1945, and the Second World, World War, really needs no introduction because if you haven't heard of him, you have probably mistaken Reba for Tesco's, <laughs> where you might or might not find Anthony Graham. Um, he says this, I expect the worst both from reviewers and sales, and then with any luck I may be proved wrong. Well, he certainly has been proved wrong in that regard. Let's hope that, for his sake that he's not proved wrong tonight. Anthony Beaver. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, <clears throat> Nietzsche was right when he wrote, he who fights with monsters should look to it that he himself does not become a monster. But in warfare, especially in total warfare, moral rectitude is hard to maintain in a fight for national survival. It's easy to forget this when applying retrospective judgment from a position of safety long afterwards. Surely the point is to understand first why things were done and then decide whether the circumstances of the time justified them or not. The Germans started the bombing of cities, Madrid, Madrid, Durango, Guernica in the Spanish Civil War. The destruction of Warsaw followed in September 1939, Rotterdam in May 1940. Then there was the machine gunning of refugee columns by Luftwaffe fighters. This was followed by the Blitz on London, <coughs> by the bombing of Coventry, Belgrade, Heraklion, Minsk, Smolensk, Leningrad, Moscow, Voronezh, Stalingrad, and countless other towns and cities in the Soviet Union. And I'm not aware of many German civilians, like English, British civilians, objecting to this at the time, even in private. The Luftwaffe's attacks may not provide a perfect legal justification for bombing German cities in return. Yet it certainly constitutes a pretty natural reaction in the circumstances, especially when the overwhelming majority of the British public say nothing of the oppressed populations in occupied Europe 
were crying out for retaliation. But revenge was not the motive, at least not the primary motive. Bomber Command's early attempts to restrict its targeting to military objectives in daylight were a total failure in 1939 and 1940, as you've already heard. Churchill was horrified in late September 1941 when he received the Butt Report. It estimated from photo reconnaissance that only one aircraft in five dropped their bombs within five miles of the target. This was a truly desperate time. The Wehrmacht was advancing on Moscow, and almost everybody expected that the Red Army would collapse. In any case, Churchill, although furious with the RAF over the inaccuracy of the bombing revealed in the Butt Report, could not deny our Chief Marshal Portal's argument that the British Army could do very little. Only the RAF could intervene with the aerial bombardment of targets in Germany. Portal recommended the bomber command should be increased to 4,000 heavy bombers. The Soviet Union, at the same time, had no long-range bomber force capable of hitting targets in Germany. So for Britain to do nothing or to try to bomb isolated military installations at a horrendous cost in RAF aircrew was unthinkable. And there's no doubt that from the autumn of 1942, the Allied bombing of Germany began to hurt Wehrmacht morale on the Eastern Front, even if it didn't crack civilian morale at home. But much more to the point, Hitler's anger with Goering over the Luftwaffe's inability to stop the bombers getting through forced Nazi Germany to withdraw the bulk of its fighter squadrons and its 88mm anti-aircraft guns from the Eastern Front to defend the Reich. By 1944, there were just 1,200 heavy anti-aircraft guns left for the whole of the Eastern Front, yet more than 7,000 back in Germany. And if these 88mm anti-aircraft guns, which were the most devastating anti-tank weapons of the whole war, had not been withdrawn from the Eastern Front, one dreads to think how many more Soviet soldiers would have died. This concentration of firepower in Germany, altogether 15,000 heavy and light anti-aircraft guns, also affected the Western Front come D-Day. By June 1944, there were only 132 of those 88mm guns in the whole of Normandy. And one must not forget that this gun, used in an anti-tank role, destroyed many more Allied tanks in the Second World War than German panzers managed to. So the already heavy losses of British and American tank crews in Normandy could have been a massacre. Even more decisive to the outcome of the war was the withdrawal of Luftwaffe fighter squadrons and formations from the Eastern Front to defend German cities. And this gradually tipped the balance of air superiority away from the Luftwaffe. The strategic bombing offensive as a whole greatly accelerated Soviet advances on the Eastern Front as a result, and almost certainly shortened the war considerably as a result. In fact, one of Bomber Command's attacks on the Ruhr on the 12th of March 1943 destroyed the main Panzer Construction Center and thus delayed the, construction, the production of the new Panther tank. Since Hitler was relying on this new tank for the upcoming Kursk offensive, this greatly contributed to its continual postponement all the way from April until July 1943. By that time, when the battle finally started, the Red Army was well dug in and waiting. And the titanic clash at Kursk smashed the Wehrmacht's panzer arm to such a degree that some historians have cited Kursk as one of the major turning points of the war. Air Chief Marshal Harris, the head of Bomber Command, did not give a jot about anything except his own self-defined mission of breaking German resistance. He became even ever more obsessed with his belief that the bombing of cities would shorten the war and thus save hundreds of thousands of lives. Harris was certainly proved to be wrong, and I would never attempt, like Patrick, to justify the continued bombing of German cities into 1945. But as the great writer W.G. Sebald pointed out in his book, on the natural history of destruction. The British had invested so much in materials, treasure, and manpower, to say nothing of lives lost to develop Bomber Command, that they could not bear to stop using it while Nazi Germany fought on. And that was the great tragedy for the German people. The shock of the Ardennes Offensive and the appearance of German jet fighters and the new U-boats in the winter of 1944 made many Allied commanders wonder whether the war would drag on into 1946. And we should not overlook some of the misunderstandings about the bombing in the autumn and winter of 1944. American Air Force propaganda pretended that they were hitting precision targets, what they called pickle-barrel bombing. 
while the RAF just went on carpet bombing cities. But Bomber Command was in fact also hitting oil targets uh, when the weather permitted. In fact, during this period, the Americans achieved just 4% more strikes on oil targets than the RAF, a minimal difference. The idea that precision bombing was possible all the time during one of the worst periods for visibility for many years is ludicrous. The US 8th Air Force had to drop more bombs non-visually, which in fact meant carpet bombing an area target, than it could visually. The question that we must ask ourselves is how would the war have turned out if we had not used our heavy bombers against Nazi Germany? The Wehrmacht was defeated almost entirely on the Eastern Front. It sustained 90% of its casualties there. The strategic bombing campaign was our only way of helping the Red Army until we could land armies in Northern Europe. The Nazis invented total warfare in their brutal invasion of Poland in September 1939. They showed no distinction between soldiers and civilians. In their subsequent invasion of the Soviet Union, 14 million civilians were bombed, shot, and starved to death, in addition to the 9 million military dead. A militarily weaker Britain could hardly hope to achieve anything against such atrocities with conventional land and sea warfare. Once again, I would like to emphasize that we must understand the situation as it really was at the time. We should be careful when indulging in the luxury of moral judgment with the hindsight of 70 years. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anthony. Now, just before we go ahead with that, I should like to enlighten you about what you all felt before you had the opportunity of hearing our distinguished panel. No doubt you are already in the process of changing your mind one way or the other, but here's what you felt when you came in to this auditorium. For the motion that the Allied bombing of German cities in World War II was unjustifiable, 83 of you. Against the motion, 136. But, and here is the interesting point from the point of view of finding out who wins this debate at the end of the evening, 96, 96 of you, when you came through the door, professed that you didn't have an opinion or didn't know which way to vote. This gentleman at the front here first. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It, it seems to me that we have some slight as often happens in these debates, dialogue of the deaf, very interesting dialogue as it is. The question I'd like to ask uh, those opposing the motion is not uh, whether, which they seem to be asserting, that uh, strategic bombing could be and was useful, but perhaps not as useful as it could have been, but whether in fact uh, we should have continued to have aerial bombing of large cities with, as I understand it, limited uh, morale and economic consequences, should we not have done something else? Richard, um, you make the point that uh, a good alternative would have been uh, bombing to back up the armed forces and, and that kind of um, strategy, but what would that have done to address Anthony Beaver's point about facilitating the Soviet advance? In what sense would... Well, I mean, it's quite a difficult exercise because, of course, at one level, no point in rewriting the history. The history happened. Um, but but I there think is a what, point uh, in coming to a judgment yeah, yeah. about it. That's well, what what's interesting, I think, is that in the 1930s, uh, there were opportunities which other air forces took to focus on a different range of aircraft types, uh, to focus on very high-performance medium bombers, to focus on assault aircraft which would be capable of supporting the armed forces or, indeed, of independent operations. Uh, against military targets, or indeed developing uh, a, a fast and uh, accurate bomber, like the Mosquito, which would be capable of reaching targets in Germany, doing real damage to particular targets, rather than strategic bombing, which is simply a blunt instrument. You know, whatever arguments one can see for it in terms of military expediency at the time, it is a blunt instrument and was known to be a blunt instrument. So focusing on 
if, you, if we think for a moment that all those productive resources, all those scientific research resources, are now being devoted to something else, then the naval war might well have turned out very differently. Then army support might have meant that the British army was a much more effective um, force earlier in the war than it was. Uh, it might be possible to imagine Crete not being captured, for example. It's possible to imagine the North African campaign being completed very rapidly uh, in Britain's favour. It's even possible to imagine Singapore being better supported than it was. So once you actually take a commitment of strategic bombing out of the picture, and it's a very large commitment, then you've got a range of options that you might undertake, which are the same options that were used by the Germans or the Soviets and so on. Um, the dial might look very different if you, Anthony, if you turn Anthony it one Beaver, way. there was a, 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 a decent alternative. Why, didn't, why wasn't it used? Well, I'm not sure that there um, was when one looks at uh, what Richard was suggesting, um, the way that, for example, almost imitating the way that the Luftwaffe uh, acted as a sort of close support arm um, to the German army. Um, that was Richard never much on the table, but that goes back even further. It goes back, as um, I think um, he mentioned, to the 1918 and sort of the RAF's uh, desperation to be a sort of separate strategic uh, arm. So one has to accept that one as a given, whether you like it or not. Um, if you're talking about saving Singapore or any of that, I mean, at that stage, the resources hadn't really gone in to the um, heavy bomber um, investment. I mean, it was, it was about to start, it was starting. Um, but it wasn't really until sort of 42, 43 that uh, one was really seeing that major investment in materials, treasure, and all the rest of it. Well, isn't, that, isn't that part of the point, that they, shouldn't, they should have been investing in something else if they had had a slightly more conscientious view about... Well, it was a bit late to, to have helped the British Army in... Um, in, in France in 1940 um, because there they did have a lot of light bombers. Uh, unfortunately, they were totally obsolete and uh, useless. I mean, those poor f pilots of the ferry battles were just massacred. Um, and that was, um, was to a certain degree um, the case. Uh, certainly, from Crete wouldn't, I didn't think, have been saved in that particular way which he mentioned. Um, no, I think that uh, when one looks at the whole question of the Eastern Front, and let us face it, it was the Eastern Front, as I said, which actually destroyed the Wehrmacht, which was actually the decisive uh, front of the whole, and theatre of the whole war. Um, that was actually one area where we could help, and we did help. Um, I didn't think it was necessarily planned in advance, but certainly Churchill recognized it um, the moment the, the crisis of 1941 developed during that uh, course of that summer. This is well, such a crucial point that we are obviously going to come back to it in one form or another, I imagine, with your questions. But I, I'd like to, to hear more from you, and in particular addressing how much of a shortened war justifies uh, the breaking of a firm moral principle, how much you had to shorten the war by, for example, and did these strategies that both sides are talking about um, facilitate that? that? That lady there, yeah. Okay, in that order. All right. Hello, uh, my name's Laura, I'm um, Nazi Germany for my Oxford final, so that's about as far as my knowledge goes. That's interesting, good. But um, basically, I have a question for Mr. Bishop, which is that I, at one point you referred to Thomas Mann as a good German, and I think it's very dangerous to make those, those sorts of binary moral distinctions, because with an ideology like Nazism, there are obviously degrees of permeation, degrees of acquiescence in individuals among the population, and I think that to tar the entire population with the same brush and then to justify bombing as an attack on Nazism as a whole when in fact we're targeting individual Germans is very dangerous. So, okay, so you can't use a single so-called good German to justify an entire bombing campaign? No, no. I meant that lots of Germans might have been good but they were affected by a wider ideology. Um, so I don't know how you can morally justify that even if you can historically understand it. Thank you. And our third question? Lady here. I would just like to ask um, the speakers in favour of the motion. Um, they haven't, they've mentioned quite a bit about um, breaking morale in Germany, but they haven't mentioned the morale of Britain. And given that we were in a somewhat David and Goliath situation, and we, did, we had you know, far less resources than those that we were fighting, um, we had, there had to be a way to have a will to carry on. And had to be a way, I'm sorry. To have a will to, to carry on the fight and to believe that we could win. Um, and none of the speakers really seem to have touched on the morale of the British people at that point in time. Which, in your, which you're asking could only have been achieved by aerial bombing of the sort that... Yes, my understanding of the morale of the British people at the time was that 
they had suffered so much in terms of attacks okay, on them. Okay, let's, that let's begin needed. with that question, Anthony. Area bombing was very good for British morale, essentially so. Is that enough to justify it? Uh, you'd be very interested to know that the mass observation unit asked people during the war what they thought about bombing Germany. And those who lived in cities that hadn't been bombed were all for it. And those who lived in cities that had been bombed were very much against it on the whole. So that's a very interesting finding. I very much agree with the view that, that to, to make the entire German population culpable for the actions of the Nazis does raise a, a, a serious question. I mean, after all, what turned the Berlin population ag uh, against um, the Allies much more than they had been before because they weren't very happy about the Nazis was being bombed in the winter of 1943-44. Uh, um, um, it happened that Goebbels was cheered in the streets having been booed in the streets before then. But the point about hindsight I think is, is, is very crucial. Of course we must use hindsight. Of course it's comfortable and safe to do it. But if we don't learn anything from history, why on earth study it? Uh, I'm going to take three more questions now. Gentleman in the front row, gentleman in the red shirt in the aisle, and the very patient man in the green tie over there. Good evening. Uh, my name is Mark from the British Kinematographic Society. And uh, my question is really about atomic weapons and the very great possibility that they would have been used had that war, as has already been said, had that war dragged on into 46, B-29s were stationed in East Anglia, complete with atomic weapons. Now the question is, what would have been the fallout had those atomic weapons been used on their primary targets, which were in Germany, uh, as opposed to the secondary targets, which turned out to be Hiroshima and Nagasaki? I think that's such an interesting question. We'll just uh, take a quick uh, panel discussion on that. Anthony Beaver? I don't know, um, um, maybe Richard can um, correct me on this, but I mean, I don't know of any uh, contingency planning for dropping any atomic weapons on Germany, so I'm afraid that we're into um, um, counterfactual um, areas here. Um, I mean, apart from anything else, one has to remember that the prevailing wind in uh, Europe is westerly, uh, and most of the radiation would have drifted straight onto the Red Army, and I don't think that Eisenhower or Roosevelt or anybody would have been very keen on it at that particular stage. Richard, any, any quick one on that? Um, well, it is the case, of course, that the whole Manhattan Project for Atomic Weapons was designed originally for the, Euro the European War. And if the European War had gone on, and if it uh, looked as if uh, you know, there was a prospect of Allied defeat, um, sustaining that war if it, on into 1945, these are democratic countries, difficult to sustain it. Um, might it have been difficult to resist? I think we can't put our hands on our heart and say that it wouldn't have happened. The war ended, of course, before it did. But very quickly, we need to remember, of course, how often the Americans and the British discussed the use of chemical and biological weapons against the Germans. Very interesting. Now, we had two other questioners, which I put off at that time. Can we have those questions, please? Sorry. Yeah. I have some limited experience of working with the, the MOD and the military. Very limited. Um, but the one thing I learned from them is that both sides love to play with the toys, and they, they know that the toys are going to go out of date, and therefore they want to be used. How, how much does the panel think this, this might have influenced the use of heavy bombs and heavy bombers during the Second World War? They were there, therefore they had to be used in order to demonstrate the might of the military industrial complex. Excellent. And can we take one more question from, from, from you, sir, over there? My question is very simple. Um, it seems to me that the proponents of this uh, motion are really relying on the fact that it didn't work and that basically if it had worked, it would have been an entirely different thing. I'm not sure that's a justifiable stance. Um, my, my, my own uh, contribution to this is specifically targeted at the moral issue um, because uh, it's not, of course, independent of the question of, of uh, what else might have been done, could have been done, which would have been equally or more effective. But, but I think that the very fact that people here felt that, that the bombing of civilian populations was barbaric uh, should have been uh, something that set the alarm bells off. And we should really have uh, addressed the question that Bishop Bell kept asking in the House of Lords about it when he said, we are fighting barbarians. Why are we behaving like them? 
And I think that, that was a serious issue. The Committee Against Night Bombing, which was a campaigning group here during the war, to try to persuade the government and the Royal Air Force to, to use the weapons available in ways that would have not involved mass, mass murder, ma mass attacks on civilian populations, women, children, the elderly, most of the military-aged men were in the services. But th this really was for them, as it is for us today, a moral issue. Would, would your own qualms be put to rest were you to be persuaded that those who made the decision were convinced it would be effective? Sorry, you need a, we need a microphone. Oh, sorry, sorry. Yes. yes, it would. And I think if you look at Japan, then I think that, that, that does answer the question. Because if you look at the horrors of what the Japanese perpetrated, the Bataan marches, the, the, uh, the sea voyages that they forced uh, American um, prisoners of war to go through, that was a justifiable bombing. And if, if you can drop an atomic bomb and justify it to end a war, well, well, let's I, not. I, I think my, that, that, that moves question. into a separate terrain, yeah, no, and we don't want to go there. I want to pick up the second question, well, the, what was actually the question before, which was the boys' toys question. And I, I, I suppose a, a spin off from that the fact that all this institutional and capital energy had been put into creating this strategy and these bombers, so we've got it, let's use it. Was, how much was that, rather than any finely judged moral concerns, the basis for dumping all these bombs? On civilians. Patrick? Uh, I think this, that, that played a large part in, in thinking and planning. Um, when you look at uh, the advent of uh, or the arrival of Harris at Bomber Command, he was very uh, keen to impress uh, as soon as possible, and so he scraped together uh, every aircraft he could lay his hands on for the first thousand bomber raid, which was um, as, as, as much a propaganda and publicity stunt as it was uh, an, an act of war. Uh, he was determined to show for his own vanity, as well as for genuine uh, war-winning reasons, uh, that these big bombers, if used effectively, could have a devastating uh, effect on, uh, on the progress of the war. So, yeah, th there was an element of that in it. I wouldn't say it's the entire reason, though. Okay. Let's, I'm afraid, have to wrap up the question time there, though I um, would love to go on. Um, the last point I'd like to make is that... Um, we still haven't quite come to the nub of at what point an absolute moral principle should be um, altered by um, the facts. Is shortening the war good enough, or do you have to be convinced that you may be shortening the war by a few days? Is that enough to overturn the principle that you can bomb civilians, or must it be stronger than that, and you must be convinced that this is the, actually the only way of winning the war? I don't know. I don't know which of us does, but anyway, it's an excellent debate, and we're now going to find what you thought. Right, let me remind you of what you did think when you first came into this room. 83 of you were in favor of the motion that the Allied bombing of civilian cities was unjustifiable. 136 of you were against the motion and 96 of you didn't know. Here are the new figures. Ten of you still don't know. <laughs> 115 of you now support the motion and 191 are against it. So I declare the motion defeated. Thank you very much. <laughs>